looking at what the actual work is. So the activities needed, you know, taking a step back saying, okay, to run this thing, this product, this service, what activities are needed? Forget team names, forget names of existing departments, just writing down the activities needed and particularly looking at that flow of new work. So what starts, where does it go? What happens? What decisions are made? And you start to reveal some of the underlying backbone of how things are working at the moment. And that gets you to lift out of professions, areas of responsibility. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast, where host Barry O'Reilly seeks to synthesize the superpowers of extraordinary individuals to think big, start small, and learn fast. Here's your host, Barry O'Reilly. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast. On this show, I'm delighted to be joined by Kate Tarn, a service leader and designer and author of the fantastic book, The Service Organizations. Now, I had the pleasure of meeting Kate many years ago in London when we took part in what was a fun startup weekend called Lean Startup Machine. It was the very earliest days of Lean Startup and many people were figuring out and getting excited about building products over 48 hours with a set of new customers. Over that time, I've seen her career and her work go from strength to strength. She's worked in fantastic public and private organizations to help their services better and was a key member of the UK's government digital service, GDS, and their Centre for Digital Public Services. It's exciting to have her on to share her story and what she's learned in all those many years, and I can't recommend her book to service organisation enough. So before we dive into what she's doing now, let's have a look at what she's been doing and get started. When you reflect back over a sort of varied career, and I think more than like seminal moments, I looked back with surprise at realizing the connecting thread that ran through pretty much everything I've done. So long ago, I started out in big service organizations, working in telecoms, in internet service providers. And I was covering everything from operations to marketing to product. And it included, you know, when there'd be a problem with a service and no one could figure out what was happening and I'd have to spend hours trawling through scripts to find the bug in the software that was affecting it all or making sure we'd got enough cover over the weekend in terms of customer support. So I was doing everything around service ownership before I'd ever thought about it as a thing. And I think that was all good, but there came a moment when I realized, well, we could do all of this stuff. There was a an organization I was working with, they were quite into kind of promoting, running discounts, running offers and so on. I was like, this is all very well and good from a marketing perspective, but if if people are enjoying themselves, if they're getting what they need, I feel like we could spend less on giving out money. So that was like definitely one moment when I was like, hang on, if we just design this to work really well, if people love using it, then I feel like that that is a way into marketing rather than having to offer promotions and so on. Such a good point, right? I feel like when you have to buy customers, you're probably not doing it right. Like you say, as you if you create these amazing experiences for people, that sells itself. What was the aha there? Like I, as I say, got to meet you. We were doing Lean Startup Machine, which was this sort of notion, and I guess in the very earliest days of even Lean Startup, where people would come together for 48 hours over weekend, meet a whole bunch of people that you've never met before and a couple of people would pitch ideas and everyone would then go, yeah, that sounds fun and break into teams and try and build stuff for like frantically for the next 48 hours, which was again, super fun, super high energy. And if I remember you were really interested in building something around the care space, which was even then was like really fascinating to me. I think we were trying to build like a wine store which says probably more about my focus in life (laughs) but again it really struck me even then your approach to customer development to understanding a need that was a little bit invisible to me at the time but I could hear you articulate the problem very quickly and you could see people who were really understanding like this challenge and how you were trying to tackle it so what have been some of those skills that you've managed to build up over time to sort of recognize when you're identifying these challenges, building great services to deliver them. You've done this numerous times. You were lucky enough to be part of the gov.uk work in the very, very beginning, which was really 
one of the seminal public service innovations where the British government essentially, you know, got people to really work on public services and make them better. It's probably globally one of the first sort of institutions to do that. And you've obviously gone on from there. But like, what were some of the lessons that you learned maybe in that experiment that has helped you inform the book and this idea of service organizations for companies that are typically like really big, maybe different sets of challenges? What did you start to see? Good question. I remember that uh, Lean Startup Weekend, and it has to be, what, 12, 13 years ago or more. Like Don't tell people that. how old we are, Kate. They still think we're teenagers. <laughs> but I find problems, and I find people really interesting. And I had already been imagining what happens when we get really old. Like, what is the status of care? And looking with horror at the state of care homes. So that was a really fun problem to work on. And that was one of my first examples of having like a unbelievably high performing team come together who hadn't known each other what you can achieve in 48 hours by running a sort of very rapid user center testing iterating process and we successfully got a funding offer within that 48 nice. hours i don't know if you remember but in terms of then applying that into large organizations so what became interesting to me was not just here's a great process, here's a great approach to designing or creating a product or a service from scratch where you don't know with certainty what's going to work. You try a few things, you learn along the way, and hopefully you iterate your way towards success. That's great. And I became like a firm believer in that process. But when you then are inside a large organization, trying to make that happen in more places, in more teams, like it's, you know, it's the challenge is not so much getting one team doing it, it's how do you get to the scale of having dozens of teams and then everybody across the whole organization, whether that's from operations, whether that's from policy, all able to work and then deliver better services by default, you end up with an entirely different set of questions and challenges. So something I've been doing over the years and partly why the book came out is because I started capturing what those questions are. What does it mean for the way that governance work, how decisions are made? What does it mean for the flow of money through an organization and how that helps or hinders good products and services? What about leadership activities and team structures? What about the corporate planning process? And then at a fundamental point, it starts to challenge notions of accountability and how people think, how that process works. Is it like one person who's ultimately going to get fired if something goes wrong? Is that the best model, healthiest model of accountability? How else might we think about making stuff happen? And whether it's in public service or private sector, there are some really similar challenges, I think. I feel like they're sort of like the tenants of, even in startups too as well. These are challenges about understanding how decisions are made, what gets worked on, especially from funding, who is responsible. Accountability is, I think, every favorite manager's word to give out that they don't seek accountability or people aren't taking enough accountability. I was actually in a call this week with a company that had been doing some work with, and it was interesting, like one of the senior executives would, was, was asking these questions, right? Who owns this? Who's responsible for that? We're lacking ownership on these services or products. And it was interesting, right? And I hear that a lot. I even hear that in nobody's studios when we're trying to build companies. We're always struggling with like, who's going to make the decision here? So what have been some of the observations you've had then? Like, what have been some of the, the sort of systems and structures where you've seen it work well? And like, maybe classically, like, what do we need to unlearn here? What are the things that we probably have been taught are the way to do it, but you've seen actually better ways to sort of push past it? Yeah. So our notions of what accountability looks like and that it means ownership and that means a single person who becomes you know you've heard that phrase the single ringable neck or something it's yeah i've got some marks on mine from look at it this is from back in the day you know <laughs> still still the scars are there it's an awful phrase but i think it is a useful phrase in that it shows how some senior executives and C-suite executives might think accountability looks like in terms of if you've got a single person, that's the person you go to saying, right, can I have the thing? Is it going to be delivered by March? Can you guarantee it? Great. 
and it's a kind of false assurance. And I say false, not because there aren't really good people that you can ask to do things and they'll do them, but because it drives a kind of concept that it's one person at the top who's responsible for everything, rather than a quite different model, which is more about guardianship than it is about ownership. And I think the difference there is that you introduce the concept that you are a group of people working together towards something, that rather than owning a separate part, that you're collectively guardianing the outcome you're going for, the target that you're after, the goal that you're trying to make happen, or what you're collectively trying to shift away from and move towards. And the model of what accountability looks like when you have more of that in place starts to change. And it doesn't mean it becomes lesser. It doesn't mean things don't get delivered. It doesn't mean you can't know what's happening. The how you come to know those things start to shift. And the idea is to put some of the decision making and the choices about work as close to the work and learning as where it's possible to happen, but still maintaining the need to plan, the need for oversight, the need for assurance. You didn't have to lose that by working in these ways. Well, you know, one thing is you're describing this, right? I keep thinking about the best teams I've ever worked on. And there was this notion of nobody was like the manager. There was real high clarity on what needed to get done. I think about one example, right? We were rebuilding the website for Channel 4 in the UK. It's like a TV site. And it was notorious because the site used to always go down. Uh, they had any time, Jamie Oliver, famous chef, would go, hey, go get the recipe at the end of his show on whatever Wednesday night. And like loads of people would go to the website. It would just blow up. And building it actually involved not just one team, but there was like a people who were an operations group, people who were a software group, a product group that were trying to build content machine. So there's a lot of different parties from different companies. Some were like consultancies, some were inside Channel 4, some were like an outsourced IT supplier. But actually, the power of that team was everybody working together. It would have been very easy to fall into the pattern of if the site went down, that everybody just looked at the operations person and was like, hey, you're responsible for that. But there was a, a sense of clarity about what we were trying to achieve and everyone owning their piece of, of the pie. It's kind of hard when I think about like, what were the things that helped us create that? Because when we were struggling and we struggled in that project, especially in the beginning, there was definitely like the hunt for like the name or bring me the head of an engineering group because we're behind on our story points or bring me the head of the designer because the user flows are not performing as we hoped in user testing. There is always sometimes for external stakeholders this need to have someone was brought up in front of them to sort of be given the shaky finger conversation with, and you're going to go fix this because we cannot fail on this project. It's interesting as you describe it, right? Because I felt like all the external forces were always looking for like that one person to be the, the sacrificial individual. And yet somehow within this sort of situation, it was really great. We were all like in this one big room, all these different companies working as a team. That was sort of unshakable in a way from all these external others that were trying to find that one person when there was a failure, and there were many, to like put the accountability on, if you will. That's right. And it can be pervasive as well. So you end up, like you say, on a bit of a hunt for the for whatever the group is, and a lot of blame starts circulating because you need to share the fear of responsibility. And you know, it happens in public services too, where you have teams responsible for compliance and enforcement or auditing and transparency. And then their job is really difficult because of the way the, the service is designed. And then you've got your digital people and your design people and your research people. And it's really until there's a sense of what brings that team together. And I think you've hit on part of it, which is having a clear goal like a, a shared sense of what we're moving away from. And that might be a conceptual model of whether your model is we're moving different cases through a system or we're trying to help people to get a particular outcome. It kind of changes how you organize. You've also seen like the chaos that can ensue when you try and have no single person in charge and loads of people trying to do stuff. Oh yeah, no, no. I see that very regularly, especially in OE studios when we're throwing like 
you know, seven people that have never met each other from different parts of the world together on a team <laughs> to build a startup. And <laughs> people are nice generally, and they all look at each other. And sometimes people don't know to grab the mic. They don't want to be rude because they're just meeting people for the first time, you know, and then suddenly opportunities get missed because people are being generally polite. They don't want to seem like too aggressive or assertive or it's interesting, right? And they give them two or three weeks and you give them a bit of guide rails and a bit of structure. And then when there's opportunities, there's almost like the people just start stepping up, which is great when it happens. But the first few weeks, it's almost like at a dance party, everyone's standing up against the wall and the music's on and no one wants to be the first person to bust a move on the dance floor. Imagine like an agile organization like multiplying that problem by like dozens, if not hundreds of teams. And especially if those teams are meant to be sort of demonstrating new, different, modern, agile ways of working, it can just end the case. You need some structures and ways of doing things, I think. And having a sense of what you're aiming for, not so much a target state, but a sort of a set of ideas or some performance indicators or something can help. But it really takes everybody to see that, yeah, it's more of the whole working as a whole for the good of what you're driving at rather than, you know, as a designer doing the design bit or as the compliance officer doing the compliance bit, for example. Yeah. What are some of the techniques then you, how do you get people all dancing together on the dance floor? Because those are the constructs, I think, that help give people, like you give them the guide rails and then the magic starts to happen. So when you're meeting these teams, what are some of the principles you look for or try to apply? Yeah, so I'm typically coming in at the, the stage where there's probably, you know, a few high-performing teams, you know, digital teams, delivery teams, agile teams, call them what you will, and they're doing awesome stuff. So maybe they've completely sorted out the way that a customer might register or find out about a thing or apply for something. And there's really awesome work happening, but the rest of the organization, the other teams are not working in the same way. And that's starting to cause problems enough that people are starting to think about how, how are we organized? Are we structured in the best way, given what we're trying to do here or given what a goal is, like maybe saving money or growing revenue? And I think the first thing to do is, we've talked about being clear about what you're trying to move, move towards, but looking at what the actual work is. So the activities needed, you know, taking a step back saying, okay, to run this thing, this product, this service, what activities are needed? Forget team names, forget names of existing departments, just writing down the activities needed and particularly looking at that flow of new work. So what starts, where does it go? What happens? What decisions are made? And you start to reveal some of the underlying backbone of how things are working at the moment. And that gets you to lift out of professions, areas of responsibility. And then you think, okay, so if we were going to organize to do this in the most efficient way, what kind of things might we have? And you start to draw out some really important questions like, should we have end-to-end -end service ownership from an operational perspective? Don't know. Pros and cons. Should we organize around the idea of having a single account? So a single view of customers across. Don't know. Like that's an enormous amount of work. There are, what do we want to do here? So you just try and draw out some pretty fundamental questions that are at the core of probably how your organizations organize today. And you don't need to answer everything immediately. There's a kind of roadmap, there's a kind of sequence to it, but it's a way to kind of shift away from the scary idea of complete reorg structure into what do we actually need here to make something work well? Yeah, because the reorg is always, it feels like the ultimate antidote in some respects. I'm thinking again of a lot of companies at the moment when they're trying to digitally transform. Most of the time, I don't think anybody knows what that really means to them. So it's hard to get clarity on it. And then often I think as people who are in those companies, they probably feel like someone comes in and they used to be a business analyst and now suddenly they're a product manager, whatever that means. And then they used to have meetings on Mondays, but now they're called standups and they're sort of the same meeting. It's almost like this whole rebranding exercise and yet they struggle. Why are we doing this? What's different? Like I'm a big believer that you shift your mindset by shifting the way you behave because um. you start acting in a different way. You see the world differently, right? Like when you put teams that were in silos in a cross-functional context, that change in structure 
you suddenly have a designer sitting with a tester going, oh, I, ne I never thought about how my design would be tested from the beginning. Normally, I design something and it works its way down the, the pipeline and a tester tests something and goes, oh, this doesn't make sense to me or whatever, right? And there's this slow feedback cycle there. But those changes in structure have like a profound effect sometimes. That's just within software delivery teams. I think the way you're describing service design to me is thinking like, call center staff sitting with business owners who are in head office. I've seen this in like these big entities, whether it's big government organizations or big public companies as well, where the strategy people live in HQ and they're dreaming up these amazing programs that are going to be rolled out. And all the real information actually lives in team that are dealing with where customers are ringing up, experiencing all the problems of this strategy was, that was designed on a whiteboard and never really robustly tested or informed. And those people taking the calls actually know more about how the actual program works and the people who designed it. You know, so like how you bring those people together to actually design services from the beginning, it doesn't really happen. I see it happen a bit in putting engineers and designers and testers together, like in like agile teams but to your point about the planning process and budgeting process you have these huge waterfally slow siloed processes like the annual planning and budgeting thing going on these little agile teams trying to deliver software then who generally hand it over to a big operations group that are super waterfall it's i almost call it like annual fuzzy scrum ban kanban delivery ops or something like this <laughs> yeah how are you helping to nurture that concept of truly like end-to-end -end thinking and getting those people even to think about why would it be value for them all to spend time together and design services together. There's so much frustration in it as well. Like if you're working in a, an operational team or a contact center and there's constant change programs, but you cannot see the point. It just sounds like process rather than what the actual point of it all is. In writing the book, I got the honor of speaking to dozens of big organizations and individuals within them that have been trying things. They've been trying things, they've been learning what works, they've been adapting as they go to tackle some of this. So there's an example in there about some of the way in which the universal credit, it's a system of financial support um, to people um, to do with being out of work or low, low income. And the way in which they've organized some of their teams, and particularly on the operational transformation side, has been exemplary. I think we've learned a lot about how to get designers working with developers and so on, like yeah. that whole process. But we haven't thought about, well, actually, the people doing the job day to day who are doing the business as usual approach, but still, it's all part of the same thing. So bringing that much closer together. And that takes a really intentional effort and it takes leaders who really get what's needed and they can carve out the space needed. So for example, for a couple of hours, once a week, all frontline operations shut down to give teams the time to discuss what's coming down the pipeline in terms of software changes, in terms of system changes, in terms of policy changes, in terms of how they want to experiment this week by having this conversation in a different way. And then they'll learn and regroup. There are communications that come out once a week saying this is a heads up this is what's happening they've identified new roles who are responsible for taking more of the information in and then looking at who's got it who hasn't who needs a bit more support and i think it's one thing to kind of talk the talk of oh you know we're going to do end-to-end -end services and it's going to be great and we're going to you know take a much more customer focused approach it's another thing for people to really understand oh okay it means we need a few hours each week from everybody, it means we're going to stop yes. doing that for that time. We're going to create a new role. We're going to fund people who are going to actually make it happen. We're going to have an amazing two-way loop between the software development teams, like the agile teams and the operations team. They're going to have time together. They're going to get to know each other. They're going to build relationships so that they can collectively triage what needs to happen. It's a whole new, different way of working. You don't have to do it all overnight. You can sort of learn what works, but it does require change. It requires intention and effort and the behavior to want to make it happen. Yeah. And like what I read as well is investment. Say you're going to close down the call center for two hours a week to do briefings of how the product's going to change. Also 
for a challenge for the people on the front line to share back to the folks building, like what's working, what's not working. Most companies would never do that. Even I've been guilty of software rollouts where all we cared about was deploying the software. Like no one ever talked about what the support staff would have to do to support it. I think maybe we made like a deck with like five slides in it to like send to them and go, hey, there's a new feature. (laughs) You know, like, uh, yeah. And even now, like, would we, we sort of go back to them and because software is so much this, oh no, we've got the metrics. We might measure metrics now to see like how customers behave with our software. We don't, we don't need that. And it's funny, like some of the most insightful moments I've ever had building stuff was actually like going and sitting at the call center staff and like listening to the, the calls that would come in to hear like what was working or not with the service. It was like some of the most insightful stuff ever. Because one of my first jobs was actually working in a computer support center, right? I was on tech support where it was for gateway computers and they used to roll out the computers and you could tell even in the support teams, within two days, whenever a new product came out, everyone in that floor knew exactly what the flaws were with it, what didn't work, what software updates broke things okay. and all the information was there, but I'm not really sure we sent it anywhere. So it's always really interesting just to yeah be reminded of those things and how we can do them. Just for you then, like looking forward, you've written this book. You know, it's very, I think, applicable to people in large and small organizations. I know you probably say you, you're spent more time in larger organizations, but as someone who's trying to build startups in nobody's studios, all these problems you're describing, I still live them every day. <laughs> They're sadly, they don't go away in relative to scale. But what are you excited about in terms of where the future direction of this space is moving and how you're hoping to contribute to it? Great question. So for me, the book is the playbook for how to chapter by chapter address each of the big knotty problems that come up when you're trying to get everybody in a position to make better products and services by default by working together. My goal with it was if it can save time, if it can save energy, if it can reduce frustration, if it can get things working better, in the, some of the largest organizations that probably are the telcos, the insurers, the utilities, and so on, as well as the public sector, then that would be awesome. But I think it represents a moment in time and a shift from the last 10 years. We've got really good, mostly, at building software, building technology, better. design. Better. Okay. It's okay to say better. Yeah, we've got better. <laughs> we've got better. Bringing in user centered design into many places by default, that's great. Now it's a question of how we scale that. And it starts to touch on some of the traditional professions around change management, around information computing technology and what's expected there. The idea that you have a sort of separate digital entity that delivers on behalf of the organization. All of these things start to become a bit questionable at scale. So I'm really excited about the idea that we look at what a modern large organization needs to take into account and to kind of do this better at scale sustainably so that it just becomes the way things work rather than the push by a group of people or an individual inside an organization. You know, personally, being involved in the journeys, I get to speak to a lot of senior leaders and executives across different big organizations. So, and I also lean to the practical So we can talk endlessly about the problems that we see because they're everywhere. And after a bit, I'm like, "Mm, okay, what are we going to do this week? What's one meeting we could have? What's a thing we could make that puts a different light on this? How do we constructively challenge this approach to kind of bringing it so that we can make some progress because it can get stuck in circular conversations otherwise. So I'm really excited for what this means for organizations generally, how they're organized and how enjoyable it is individual to be part of working in these places as well. Yeah, well, look, I think the book's fantastic. I highly recommend anyone out there to get a copy of it. The service organization. Look, it's been great to catch up, Kate. I'm going to keep following what you're doing, following your blog at katetarling.com. It's always good to see these great things and the momentum you're making. So good luck with it. And I'm sure we'll have you back on the show again to share even more. Wonderful to catch up, Barry. Thanks so much. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that show, but I'm even more delighted to share the exciting news. I've recently co-founded a new venture studio named Nobody Studios. Now, Venture Studio is a vehicle for the rapid creation of new companies from ideation to acceleration and growth. 
And our purpose at Novody Studios will be to de-risk pre-seed stage business ideas. We'll do this by minimizing the time, speed, and capital involved in validating truly repeatable and scalable business models before any significant venture investment. We've an audacious goal to start 100 compelling companies over the next five years, and who knows how many beyond that. So if you're interested in radically changing the way work is done, how products are created, companies built and funded, even democratizing the wealth creation and how returns are distributed, this could be the business for you. We're looking for talent, capital, and influence. If you wish to contribute any or all of these, just get in touch. You can follow us on nobodystudios.com, on our LinkedIn page, all the social media accounts, or simply my newsletters and what I'm sharing. We'll be launching a truly innovative crowdfunding campaign, and I'd be honored if you'd be willing to join us on this journey and become a nobody yourself.